All right. Hello, welcome everyone. We're gonna give a few moments for folks to join and get settled, grab a snack, grab a drink, grab whatever you need to feel comfortable, perhaps something to jot down notes and ideas. This is super exciting. And I'm wondering if um, I'm able to see, sorry about that, any comments, because it'd be cool to know where everyone is joining us from. Um, I'm currently in Chicago, where it is is really cold. So I'm excited to talk about lighting a flame and mm -hmm. connecting and, and you know warmth. Um, yeah, and my name is Tania. I am an educator with the Pleasure Chest. I am also the general manager of our Chicago location. I've been with the company for about six years and education, sex education, um, in particular pleasure-based sex education is super important to me and it's important to the pleasure test. So I'm just really excited to get to connect um, on this level and uh, discuss some great ways to discover your body and your desires, as well as connecting that with uh, folks you play with. Uh, how about you, Casey? Yeah, thank you. My name is Casey Tanner. I am an ASEX certified sex therapist, um, and I'm the creator of the Instagram account Queer Sex Therapy, where I do a lot of work around gender and sexual diversity. Pronouns are they, them. Um, and I'm here because I do consulting work for Lalo, an incredible luxury toy company, and we're going to be highlighting some of their products at the end, and they also happen to be the sponsor for this event. Awesome. And where can we find you, Casey, if you want yeah, a, a plug? Yeah. Well, I am sitting here in New York, but if you want to find me online, it's Instagram at Queer Sex Therapy. Or if you want therapy, my therapy practice is theexpansivegroup.com. Awesome. And if you want to find me, I'm actually a visual artist um, and I have an art page on Instagram. It's uh, Portals for Mortals. Um, and I know that, that those links will be available. If you ever want to check out what I'm working on. Yeah. So we're going to get started here. Um, just a general welcome to the Pleasure Chest. Welcome to a Pleasure Chest workshop. Um, we've been around since 1971. We actually just celebrated our 50th anniversary last fall. Um, so we, we've been around for a while and um, it's always been our goal to prioritize pleasure-based sex education and make that accessible for everyone, um, the, you know, uh, inclusivity and uh, including all sorts of possibilities and options for all bodies. Um, this is something that we truly hold important, which is why we have workshops like this. Um, Casey, did you want to share anything about Lilo? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So Lilo created their company to put an emphasis on self-care as it relates to pleasure. Um, before Lilo, there wasn't a lot of discussion around pleasure and self-care in toys, and now they're really creating that conversation. For me personally, I identify as queer, and my passion is specifically looking at ways that um, queer folks and trans folks can incorporate pleasure into their self-care routines. All right, and there are just a few ground rules um, before we get started and we get into the thick of things. Um, just a reminder to not kink shame or uh, desire shame anyone. Um, I, I know we can't hear y'all, uh, but it, it, this kind of stems from when we would teach workshops in person. Um, sometimes we might have a really strong reaction to uh, certain things that certain folks are into or certain things that we may not be familiar with. So it's just important to know there's something out there for everyone and we're free to explore that and also find empowerment in that. Um, that is why we're also intentional with our language. Um, as well as like focusing on helping you find the language that uh, leads you to embodiment and empowerment in the journey 
that you have. It is a journey. I, I like to think that we don't get to one place and stay stagnant um, and that there are so many different directions we can go in. Um, so our language is inclusive. If you've uh, shopped with us, you, you'll know like we refer to internal, external stimulation. This also just helps to bring awareness that um, a lot of times we can uh, feel these sensations pretty similarly. It's hard to describe, um, but to know that, you know, uh, a rectile tissue can feel uh, very similar uh, depending on who you're talking to. So um, we also uh, will leave time, my bad, we will leave time for questions at the end. Um, if you have any questions, you can definitely uh, type it. Uh, in the in the comments, and we will take note of that. So you want to listen closely and take notes. As I said, I hope you grab some uh, paper and a pen, something to write with, because we are doing a, a giveaway. So we'll be giving away a Sona two, and the first person to answer correctly will win this giveaway at the end, and that is like an amazing prize to get. Um, so yeah, pay attention and jot down your notes. Awesome. Thanks, Tania. So as I mentioned, I really view all sex and masturbation as an opportunity for self-care, if that's a way that you want to frame it for yourself. Um, I think many of us were raised to have shame around masturbation, to feel like it's something we're not allowed to do. Um, maybe we even got in trouble for masturbating at certain times in our lives. So I really wanted to highlight today the benefits of solo play because research does show that there are so many positive uh, benefits of engaging with your body solo and that you don't need a partner with you to get those same benefits. Um, so studies have shown that uh, masturbation and solo play can uh, decrease stress. It can increase really wonderful neurotransmitters like endorphins, uh, serotonin, those happy brain chemicals. And many people use solo play as a natural pain reliever. And uh, an example that comes up a lot is um, around menstrual pain. So masturbating while one is on their period as a way to decrease, um, decrease cramping. Um, it increases blood flow, um, it can increase focus. So there are a number of physiological benefits to engaging in solo play. Um, but I think, you know, one of the major ones is that, you know, I think many of us um, had to approach sex with very little knowledge. For those of us who had sex at, usually it was not very good. Many of us didn't have any at all. So we showed up to our first sexual experience, crossing our fingers, doing the best that we could. Um, and what I love about solo play is it's actually an opportunity to learn through experiencing your own body. And you don't have to wait to learn to uh, when you have a partner, you, can act, you actually have everything you need at your fingertips when you're alone. Um, and so exploring your body through solo play is a great way to figure out some of what Tania will talk about later, which is what do I like? What sensations feel right for me? What temperatures feel right for me? What lighting do I like? Uh, what music do I like? Create a playlist for your solo play. There's no reason that you can't treat yourself um, during solo play the same way that you might set the stage for partnered play. Light yourself a candle, right? Um, and I also think that sometimes we silo solo play to just um, masturbation on the genitals. And that is not at all what we're limited to. Um, you can do solo play uh, with any number of erogenous zones on your body. You can explore kinks by yourself. Um, and so it is not just, you know, the vibrator and your genitals that are at play during solo play. There's actually an unlimited number of ways that you can explore sensuality in your body. Um, and it may not necessarily involve what you think of tr as traditional masturbation at all. It might be taking a shower and really slowly um, massaging oil or body wash onto your body and seeing what that feels like. So don't limit yourself to thinking that solo play is only masturbation until you reach orgasm. There are many, many ways to explore your body. Um, and then, uh, you know, another kind of sort of counterintuitive uh, thing about solo play is that it actually can improve your body image. And I say counterintuitive because when we're feeling bad about our bodies, when we're not feeling sexy, 
solo play, sex may be the last thing that we think about doing. Um, but what studies show is actually if we can act as if, if we can um, even just go through the motions of showing our body love through that self-touch, um, whether that's in front of a mirror, that's sort of an additional way to show your body some love, um, that actually can improve body image. Um, so if, if you're somebody that struggles with your body and that has led you to avoid solo play in the past, this might be an interesting thing to experiment with to see how do you actually feel after engaging with your body in this way. And then for folks who are trans or gender non-conforming or non-binary who experience any kind of gender dysphoria or genital dysphoria, I really love recommending solo play as a way to feel out what are the things that help lessen that dysphoria, um, what are the different toys, ways of touching yourself, different clothing you can wear, different lighting you can have that allow you to experience euphoria in your gender. And once you learn those things, when you're engaging in partnered sex, you'll be much more able to communicate what it is that you need to feel euphoric in that context. Yeah, those are great points, um, which is going to lead me to, I am, I seem to be having trouble with the, the share screen and not seeing comments. Um, you are doing great. Keep going. Uh, yeah. You're doing amazing, sweetie. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I, so a, a lot of um, what you talked about, like, you know, deciding for yourself, um, what your pleasure routine is going to look like and even like going through the motions um even if you're not really feeling it like our day-to-day -day is so different and we can find ourselves in in different places in life um unexpectedly and that's like stress or um, life transitions and and are you hydrated are you uh going through something really difficult are you too stimulated you know um so there are you know definite benefits from um, you still like setting up that routine and setting up some sort of um, form to to get that time in with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the point about overstimulation is a good one too. Um, and I think you know we'll talk about this more as we go, but not everyone wants a really intense solo play experience. Maybe you've had a really overstimulating day, a really stressful day at work, and the thing that you actually need is gentleness. And I think I think you have some thoughts later on how you know there's such a wide range of sensations that we can give ourselves. Yeah, totally. All right. Um, yeah, that's leading us into discovering the type of sensation that we like. Um, I keep mentioning this word embodiment and I understand this word from like, um, as an artist, from a, like an art perspective, like how I look at the world and how I um, translate stimuli into something that's meaningful for me and something I can like act out and um, like physically feel um, uh, in a lot of different ways using my senses. Um, and that for me, tends to lead toward like a decrease in uh, stress and, and tension and um, relaxation. A body that's relaxed is um, willing to uh, explore a little more and, and notice how different stimuli feel. Um, I like to recommend that folks set aside some time, set up the materials you need and get to a place where you feel comfortable um, and really just explore your body, um, starting from the top. What does your scalp feel like? What does your hair feel like? Um, sometimes I'm, I'm in a mood where like hair on my neck and shoulders feel super sensuous to me or, um, you know, feeling like my shoulders massage, but doing that myself with an oil, as, as uh, Casey mentioned, like just self-massage, um, treating myself to nice smelling oils, um, if that's available, a nice body moisturizer. Um, using what I have first, so we have fingers and hands, and I like to use different pressure and different fabrics. Um, I don't know if you, you've ever felt a lace glove 
you know, stroke across your skin, uh, a silk glove or, you know, something a little more textured, just playing with textures and, and sensations like that. Um, feathers are also something that uh, we like to, we, we can explore. I did not like being tickled necessarily um, at, at any point in my life, but when I'm aroused, sometimes that is super cool um, because it just feels different. And um, even like the, the visual cue of seeing a feather that where there's teasing and there's excitement in that. Um, there's also ways you can play with temperature, um, and I'll get more into that a little later, um, but that can be, uh, you know, a thought on what type of materials, um, if you're venturing out beyond your hands, you're taking the next step, and you're, you're purchasing a new toy, or you're exploring a, a, a tool that you want to use. Um, there's a whole different host of materials that can have different effects on your skin, um, such as like glass and metal toys uh, that tend to keep temperature um, really well and translate temperature. Um, I like the heaviness of certain things to massage on my body. Something like this that's stiff and nice um, can be used anywhere on the body if we're not even thinking like uh, using this internally, just working out knots in your body, feeling what something cool feels like on your nipples, um, on different sensitive parts of your body. Um, and I'm seeing the screen move. Can everybody see my share screen? Can you reshare it? Because it was on the Google Doc and people were having a hard time reading it, please. That is for sure. I can totally reshare I was it. trying to take over, but then my computer decided to crap out. It's like, what's happening? <laughs> All right. Well, then Is that better? Go to the slideshow. I'm sure. Perfect. Okay, we're in business now. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh, technology, <Yes>. what? <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, temperature um, uh, and, and working with stiff toys, something a little heavier, there are softer toys. Uh, that, that are made of silicone or elastomer that mold and bend to the body in different areas and, and, and curves in your body. And these can produce really different results. And the intention that you have behind using them, um, as Casey said before, that's not necessarily, this exploration is not necessarily to get off. Like if that happens, that's awesome. Um, but to really kind of take mental note of what these things feel like and uh, what you prefer, what you don't prefer. Um, <clears throat> it's important to set all this stuff up before. Um, make sure that you, you have the things that you wanna explore first um, next to you, uh, you know, your night side table, somewhere. I keep like a little bag that I can take from room to room because who knows if I'm going to be in my bedroom or in the living room or wherever that has, you know, lube and the specific things that I want to play with in the moment. Uh, speaking of lube, I feel like everyone uh, should have a, a good arsenal of lube that <laughs> Yes. that they prefer to use. And uh, when folks stop into the shop, I like to kind of liken it to any, like if we buy body moisturizers, there are certain ones that we like, there are certain ones that we stay away from, there are certain ingredients that we pay attention to um, that, you know, we may or may not want in our products. So <clears throat> the more you try, the better. And a good tip, if you're shopping in a store, ask if they have little samples that you can take um, and, and explore it and check out the ingredients, make sure there's nothing in there that you, you're, you're allergic to. But I think try to have a really good silicone lube. And I know this might be a little difficult to see. Um, this is Uber Lube, which is actually made locally here um, in the Midwest, actually in Evanston. And um, silicone tends to sit on top of the skin um, and, and kind of stay moist a bit longer. Water-based lube 
is our bodies are made of mostly water. So once water like hits our skin, it tends to like want it like and, and absorb really quickly. Uh, but this is really great for materials, toy materials that uh, you can't use silicone glue for. This one in particular is liquid sizzle. And um, we're talking temperature. This is a really cool way to introduce temperature play um, in that this goes on a bit cool and it heats up with friction. So using this solo, you can also experiment with just your hands and the lube uh, and using some of this and using different intensity and motions when you are masturbating, when you are stroking, um, and this will heat up with friction and cool off with no friction. So it's really neat to kind of have a selection if you're, if you're looking for lubes, try to get uh, one out of each category. Um, keep mental note about how you like to touch yourself. Um, the more you start thinking about this, the easier it is to tell someone else, as well as uh, realizing kind of what gets in the way of really enjoying and getting like mind over body. Um, <clears throat> what if the, if the intention is orgasm or the intention is to, uh, to get off, building up a format, um, we teach ourselves kind of how to get off. We teach our bodies how to do that. We can switch that up. Again, we're not stagnant. Um, I encourage you to uh, try a different way. If you know you like to touch yourself, um, me, for example, uh, with the clitoris, there are legs that internally in the clitoris. And I tend to, uh, when I masturbate, stay kind of more in that like 10 o'clock area. And sometimes I might surprise myself and come in on a different area. And sometimes that doesn't feel good. Um, it just playing around and changing it up is really what makes me feel empowered. All right, I'm gonna go over it. Wait, don't go yet. Oh, my bad. <laughs> I'm gonna launch a poll for the audience. So everyone right. has about like 30 seconds to answer. Jeopardy music. <laughs> I wish I had that. <laughs> right. I'll just say while we do the poll, Tania, I, I never thought of having a bag that you can take from room to room. But that's such a great idea because we all know what it's like to have like your vibrator die in the middle of like, the heat of the moment and to not have something else ready. So I love the idea of like always having multiple things available. I'm going to use yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I, the most frustrating thing for me is when a vibrator dies. Yeah. And I, every day when I'm at work and uh, folks are purchasing vibrators. I tell them, you know, charge it, make sure you charge it before you use it. Um, keep up with charging your toy. And I'm the worst with that. And it's yeah, so frustrating. Right. And you really want to use that one toy and it's dead, you know? Horrible. <laughs> By the time it's charged, you don't want it anymore. Right? Yeah. You're like, the whole thing. <laughs> oh, we've got, we got our responses. It looks like. Feel free to go to the next slide and I'm going to mute myself again. Take it over. Okay. Sweet. I can just close this right. Perfect. All right. Oh, I guess that, that question came a little <laughs> prematurely, but the, I, I know I'm working with a smart group of folks now. So um, we're going to talk more about erogenous zones besides genitals. Um, I know, Casey, you had mentioned like not just the focus on um, on genitals and allowing yourself to explore means having mindfulness to other parts of your body. Um, butt cheeks uh, are, are in the same area as our genitals and it, it shares a network of muscles called the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and these are muscles that span from um, the front, the pubic bone to your tailbone, it kind of holds everything up like a hammock. Um, and it's a muscle that uh, 
when it's activated, contracts and releases. And this is something that over time, uh, if you are working on it and you're, you're, you're putting your mind there. And I know every time I mention Kegels in a class, folks say they start doing them. They start, you know, kind of activating that area because yeah. we, we forget about it. I forget about it. <laughs> um, but all of that is in the same area, but cheeks, that skin, um, the, the muscles that contracting and releasing um, can cause just a whole community of feeling there. Um, the inner thighs, the same, it's very close and local. The stomach, specifically like the lower stomach, nice massage there. Um, the neck, as I mentioned before, um, the neck, skin can be really sensitive on a lot of folks. Lips, um, which is why some folks enjoy kissing a lot um, is because it's, that is an erogenous zone. Um, and it feels sensuous and we already assign a lot of sensuous meaning to kissing and not everybody's into it and not all the time. Um, but yeah, uh, feet and hands as well. Um, you know, you can be really into stimulation of your feet, um, different hands, uh, hand massages and different, how different things feel on your hands too. I even think it's super sensual to just put lube in my hands and prepare to use it. Um, and what that moment feels like. Um, the back, um, and, and if you've ever had a massage and like a nice back massage, I can feel really relaxing and melt tension away. And the special spots like your inner, inner arm and the elbow, the back of the knees and the armpits, those, that skin is also super sensitive and responsive. Is this blanket on everybody? No. Does that mean, oh, uh, because I don't feel I, um, I don't feel excited when my stomach is rubbed. Are you broken? No, <laughs> that is just some folks are into that and you're discovering what makes you feel good. All right, um, I wanted to discuss some uh, signs of arousal as we're working our way through this journey. Um, if, um, if you're able to kind of focus on how your body is responding when you feel like you're at the height of your desire, when you feel like you're at the height of your excitement or just on the way there, um, your heart rate may start to increase, your blood pressure may start to increase, um, your breathing changes, um, Increased blood flow to genitals and your nipples and things get puffy and things start to kind of like show up like, hey, I'm here um, and I'm excited. Your body temperature increases, which is why sometimes if you play with temperature play, if you get a, a toy and cool it down, your body temperature is already heated up and, and you get sweaty. This is a really nice relief and, and a really uh, a different type of feel. Um, in that moment. Um, and then you, your body starts to make lubrication. Um, and even if your body isn't making that lubrication, doesn't mean you don't want to enjoy this. Do you, doesn't mean you don't want to have sex. Um, that's why they sell lube. Maybe your body's making lubrication and you're not even there yet. That's totally fine. Um, but the, the point in the exercise is to just pay attention to where you are, like how long you're playing, how long you're exploring yourself and where you are on this, on this spectrum here. All right, Casey, did you wanna talk about orgasm? Yeah, certainly you can talk about orgasm. Or is that, that's totally me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if you like to talk, whatever you want. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking so much. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take it away. Yeah, I'll take it away. So yeah, I, I, when I talk to my clients about orgasm, I, I always make a metaphor because I, I have three cats and I think about them all the time. And uh, to me, having an orgasm is in some ways like trying to chase a cat. Like the, the more you go after it, the more you obsess over it, the more you try to get it to come to you, the harder it is. 
Um, and so what I really like to encourage folks to do is to let go of orgasm being the main number one goal of sex, because the more you obsess over it, sometimes the more difficult it can be to have an orgasm. And instead paying attention to some of these other things that Tania is talking about, instead of going for that orgasm, go for the thing that makes your pelvic floor tense, go for the thing that makes you feel warm, go for the thing that makes your breathing change. And if you are going towards those things, then sort of inevitably you are moving in the direction of orgasm. Um, and so, you know, to Tania's point here, treat it as a possibility, but it's not the only goal. And in fact, for many, many people, the climax of sex or the height of sex is an orgasm. It's the, the part of sex where you felt most connected to your body or the part of sex you felt most connected to a partner or when you tried that new kink that you were really excited about. Um, it could even be, you know, the making out that felt like the peak of sex to you. So I really love sort of setting aside the idea that orgasm is this major achievement um, and thinking that there are all sorts of values that we have around sex. Um, and many of them we can play into long before we reach orgasm and maybe we don't have an orgasm and we still have a great sexual experience. It's really, really possible. Um, orgasms feel different for everybody. I think there's this myth that men orgasm one way, women orgasm another way. And we can sort of set all of that aside. Everybody orgasms in a different way. Um, there are different kinds of orgasms, but rather than focusing so much on, I wanna have this kind of orgasm, or I wanna have that kind of orgasm. Um, any, any orgasm is wonderful, but I think something that is important to mention is that most people with vulvas do not orgasm from penetration alone. Some people do, and that's wonderful and that's great, um, but most people do need some form of clitoral stimulation in order to get to an orgasm. The, the research I've been reading lately says about 70% of people with vulvas need some kind of clitoral stimulation in order to get to orgasm. Um, and then I also love to near your point here around the brain. Uh, the brain is connected to the genitals and we can't yeah. forget that we are whole bodies um, and we can't just focus on the genitals and neglect the rest of us. Um, I like to say that foreplay uh, with a partner begins the moment you wake up in the morning because the way that we interact with ourselves, the way we interact with a partner sets us up to either be um, primed and ready for sexual connection or not. Um, and so we have to you know, not silo or not, not isolate sexual experiences to just being about genitals, just being about orgasm, but to realize like if you're anxious, if you had a hard day, um, maybe you're a per person who just gave birth recently, or maybe you and a partner got in a fight, um, attend to those parts of yourself because by attending to those parts of yourself, you are inevitably attending to your sexual self and attending to, to your ability to orgasm. Yeah, those, and if I could add, um, as I like take a drink of water, um, yeah, just that consistent, like how you're taking care of yourself throughout the day. I get dehydrated so easily. Um, when I talk a lot, it's like, it all leaves. I actually have my humidifier running um, and she's super quiet, which is nice, but I have it running all the time because when I'm dehydrated, everything changes. <laughs> it's like, uh, the energy is gone. Um, the, the, uh, like the will to even do anything is gone. Um, so I, I really like to set myself up throughout the day, you know, as Casey said, um, to, uh, to have easier access to not feeling tense and being open to differentiate what orgasm feels like to me um, as they're not all the same. And I think I, sometimes I get into a headspace kind of hearing about other folks and what they're doing and comparing like, oh, this like sleazy, like Cosmo story I, I read that's probably not true. Um, you know, just Never hearing true. all these stories that folks wanted. There's always a lot of like hyperbole around like uh, what type of sex folks are having sometimes. And it's like, what am I doing? What am I, where do I fit into that? And that, it, you know, kind of takes me out of the headspace to really focus on um, how I'm responding to stimuli and how, um, how I'm using that to connect with um, the folks I play with. So, yeah. All right, y'all, I'm going to launch the next poll question. Leave that slide there, Tania. Sweet. 
All right, I'll give everyone about 30 seconds to answer. And you can keep that poll up, Tania, because this is going to for the next slide. I'm oh, sorry, can you repeat that? Something dropped in here and I was like, oh. what? <laughs> uh, this, uh, this poll relates to the next slide. Oh, awesome. Um, and, I, and if I can, if I can just talk about internal and uh, like external orgasms or how we perceive those. Um, I like, in, like internal stimulation um, like can be something that all bodies can experience. Um, I think specifically when we talk about vibration, it gets gendered a lot. Um, certain toys get gendered and, and kind of assigned to certain bodies so that like um, folks that may be curious about um, exploring internal, um, whether it's anally, whether it's vaginally, um, that we have very similar um, erectile tissue um, that can be uh, the P spot or the G spot, the prostate or the G spot, um, more uh, clinical terms for the G spot, because that name was just a assigned um, from the, I guess, guy that discovered it. Okay. And, you know, this is like language that I choose to use is like, I do like to think about it as tissue. I do like to think, because it is, it's erectile tissue and um, stimulation and massage and focus on that um, can bring about different uh, reactions in your body can bring about different orgasms um, as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll Next. share the results now. Can you go to the next slide? Sweet. Awesome. So yeah, how do we? Oh my bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, how do we? How do we tell after we've explored our bodies in solo play? How do we communicate what it is that we want? And I think when folks ask me this question, usually the question isn't how do I ask for what I want. Usually the question is how do I ask for what I want without hurting somebody's feelings? Because I think we do get so worried about taking up space that we're gonna offend somebody, that a partner's gonna think they're doing something wrong. So these are some of the ways I've learned how to talk about what I want, how to coach my clients through this um, in a way that still feels connective within a relationship or not necessarily a long-term committed relationship, any relationship in which you're having sex, including with yourself. So one thing I first say is, is lower the stakes. I think sometimes we feel like if we ask for something, we have to love it because if we took the time to ask for it, we better want it every time we have sex from here on out, but lower the stakes for yourself. It is okay to say, I'd love to try this with you. I don't know how I'm going to like it, but I'm curious about it. Let's try it. Maybe we never do it again, right? Like I'm somebody that it will try anything once, but I'm not committing to trying it for the rest of my life. And, and you don't have to either. So lower the stakes for yourself. You don't have to know you like something before you try it. And if you do like something, you don't have to do it for the rest of your life. Um, I think, you know, the fear of taking up space is a big one. Um, and I, I recommend rather than trying so hard not to hurt someone's feelings, instead, just be prepared that feelings might come up when you ask for something. We all have a little bit of fragility when it comes to talking about sex because most people didn't teach us how to talk about this. So we're all a little bit vulnerable. Um, so rather than say like, I don't want to hurt your feelings, just make space for whatever feelings do come up. Like, all right, I asked you for this. Like, how did it feel? Are we good? Are we okay? Like, um, not being so afraid of it causing a reaction, but just letting the reaction be what it is. It's okay that people have feelings about conversations about sex. It's sort of inevitable given how loaded this topic has been for many of us for most of our lives. And when you are asking for, for what you want, I do find that timing matters. There are some things that, that I think make a lot of sense to ask for in the moment. For example, if it's like higher, lower, um, slower, faster, less, more, those corrections are pretty easy to make uh, in the heat of the moment. But when you're wanting to introduce an entirely new dynamic, let's say like you want to try a new power dynamic or you want to try a completely new product, um, I recommend not doing that in the heat of the moment. It can be hard um, for people to uh, stop sex and really give the answer that feels most authentic for them. So if you're wanting to introduce something totally new, I recommend talking about it um, 
either before you have sex, after the last time you had sex, or like even over the dinner table. There's no reason you only have to talk about sex during sex. And sometimes actually the timing can be, it can be wise to choose a time outside of sex itself. Um, and we know that sometimes describing the thing you want to try with words is hard. So don't be afraid to ask permission to demonstrate. Say like, hey, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but can I show you? Um, maybe you learned how to use a toy on yourself in one particular way. Um, and you ask a partner, like, how would you feel about watching? Um, I feel like I could do a better job showing than I can telling. And that's totally okay. And when giving feedback, um, I recommend avoiding words like you always do this or you never do that. Um, it puts somebody on the defense when you start out in that way. So instead of saying like, you don't do this, you don't do that. Just remember, people can't read our minds. So unless we have asked for something explicitly, th there's just a good chance that it didn't cross the person's mind that it might be something that we want. So give a person the benefit of the doubt before you've asked about it. And then, you know, we love to make up stories about why people are requesting something. And often the story we tell ourselves is that we're not enough. Um, we're not doing a good enough job. We've done something wrong. And so when asking for something as it relates to sex, it's helpful to, to say why you're asking. Um, and maybe the why is I read about it. Uh, I read about it online and it made me really curious. Or I think this would be a fun way for us to connect with each other. Or Valentine's Day is coming up and I want to try something new. And when you can offer your why ahead of time, you just give uh, a partner the ability to really hear you out and not tell themselves their own stories about why this might be coming up right now. And then finally, good practice of consent is to just realize you might get a no. And that doesn't mean that your ask was bad. It doesn't mean the request was bad. It doesn't mean the thing you want to try isn't super hot. It just means that with this person who you're asking at this time, it's going to be a no. Um, and that's, that's about them and their preferences. It's not about you and whether you're good or bad. If you can remember that, then I think um, it's easier to take the no less personally. Yeah, totally. And before I go to the next slide, I, I really like your point about avoiding always and never. Um, and having, I guess, more, and it's more neutral to not use those absolutes in general. Right. Those absolutes can really invoke a lot of like strong feelings yes. and they're usually not true, right? Right. right. Yep. Usually there's, oh, there's always an exception to the always and never, right? There's just, there's always a time that, um, <laughs> That, that your partner did show up for you in that way. So yeah, being more neutral. And how to be spontaneous consensually. I think that, you know, consent can be a little bit scary because we're not always sure how to implement it in a way that feels sexy or that feels connective. But I really believe that spontaneity is not the opposite of consent. And that in fact, if you employ some sort of basic good practices around consent, you can actually have way more spontaneous sex. And a tool that I mentioned here that I think we'll be able to pop into the chat is called a yes, no, maybe list. Um, it's a list of different sexual acts, um, sexual experiences that you and a partner or partners can fill out either separately or together, um, where you get to say, yes, I'm interested in that. No, I'm not interested in that. Or maybe I'm not sure. Um, and then it's a great practice to sit with your partner and compare notes. What did we both say yes to? What's a solid green light for all of us? Um, what did we both say no to and is just fully off the table? What was a maybe and why did we say maybe? And under what circumstances would we be more or less interested in this thing that we said maybe to? Now that you've got the lay of the land of what's a green, yellow, and red light, now you can have sex in a way that is actually really spontaneous because you're not worried, am I about to step on a button? Am I about to hit a red light? Um, now you may hit one by surprise and that's totally okay, but the more understanding you have about what feels okay for you and partners ahead of time, actually the less anxiety you might find yourself having when it comes to the moment. Um, you may have more confidence initiating, uh, initiating sex to begin with and initiating new things because you've already had that conversation. But 
I know that, you know, some of us have sex without having time to sit down with a yes, no, maybe list. That's not always possible. We may meet someone at a bar unexpectedly and you're not going to pull out that list, or maybe you do, and that's cool too. Um, but some really sort of easy ways to employ consent in the moment are just to check in about what is happening in the present. So can I touch you in this way? Does that feel okay? Is that too much pressure? Are you comfortable in that position? How was that for you? Um, these are ways to just check in in the moment. Like, are we still good? Are we still on the same page? And for some people that have a harder time saying no for any number of reasons, including trauma or just not being taught that they're allowed to say no, sometimes we give off a no with our body language before we say it out loud. And if you do sense that somebody you're having sex with is giving off discomfort in their body language, it's totally okay to just pause and say like, hey, are, you, are we still good? Are you still comfortable? Totally better safe than sorry to just do that really quick check-in. And being somebody that has checked in with partners in that way and has been checked in with in that way, I've never once found it unsexy. In fact, I, I often feel really cared for and possibly even more turned on by a person when I feel like, I just feel like their, you know, their emotional intelligence is really high and I'm hot for that when they're asking me these questions and doing these check-ins. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I feel like I, not being asked that and not even being aware that like, you can ask those things and, and you can hear those things and may not know how to answer in the moment either. Um, but that that connection is is being created in that way um, is so sexy. Like it's it's just completely and it makes you feel comfortable. Uh, if we're talking about body tension and like uh, certain like nasty areas you feel like that just that's so relaxing to me. Right. to uh, hear how I'm feeling and um, how are you and like, how does it feel when I touch you here? Um, and that can be super, super, super sexy, can be done in a really sexy way. Totally agree. Yeah. All right. Oh. I'm just click happy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to cover this or? Yeah, yeah, I'll move through this a little bit quickly. I'm just noticing yeah. the time. Um, so yeah, so uh, different different ways to think about toys. And Tania, actually, you you're you are probably more of an overall toy expert than me. Um, but for folks with vulvas. Um, we already talked a little bit about internal stimulation of the clitoris through what we typically have heard called the G-spot, external stimulation through the clitoris. I'll highlight here, like, you know, I have a toy here. Um, this is the Lalo Enigma. You can see that it does both. It's got the internal G-spot stimulator, also has an external stimulator for the clitoris, for the external part of the clitoris. So there are toys like this that do both. And then there are toys that will focus just on external clitoral stimulation, um, and then toys that are more targeted towards internal stimulation. So there are many, many different options. Um, I personally love a toy that has multiple speeds and pressures, um, and, uh, and different pulsation patterns because within one toy, I basically get like 20 different experiences. <laughs> yeah. I get to really experiment and feel out what's best for me. Um, another thing to think about is, do you like direct clitoral stimulation? Do you like it sort of right on the head of the clitoris, for example, like using a tip like this on the clitoris? Or do you prefer something um, like this is a uh, Lalo Sila and it, you can see like actually it doesn't directly hit the clitoris. It uses sonic waves to hit the clitoris. So if your clit tends to be a little bit more sensitive, you might go for something that is a little bit more of a sucking or a little bit more of a sonic wave versus um, if you feel like you need more pressure in order to experience pleasure, going for something that's gonna give you that direct stimulation. And Tania, I'm sure you have more to add. Yeah, um, I have a lot to say about um, pressure. I also have the, a SELA. Um, and what I appreciate is the indirect. I know for me personally, I'm not direct, um, especially if, um, 
I guess like we've all been in that moment where it's like, I got to get off real quick. And, you know, you think going for the direct is like the quickest way to do it. Um, but this definitely gives me a different type of feel um, than like head on with some vibration like wands um, mm -hmm. externally, which mm -hmm. can also, this external stimulation can be translated anywhere on your body. You can use this all over. Um, where you have a wide range of intensity levels, um, which is like Casey said, you get like 20 different toys in one toy. And um, in terms of like purchasing toys, that's like a big bang for your buck. The right. more ways you can use the toy, um, the more ways you can kind of connect with it. So if you don't necessarily connect for it's like, um, the purpose that it's marketed for, um, you can be creative and find different ways. Yeah. Um, my recommendations, because it is, it's the time of year, um, uh, the, uh, the love holiday, Valentine's Day, where um, we just know we uh, need to do certain things for uh, someone special in your life or for yourself and um, do some research first before you determine like, okay, I know I want to get my Swedia toy. Um, I want to get a new toy have an idea of what's out there before you come in because it, it can be super, it like really overwhelming. Um, and the more options and the, the more like different sizes and colors and where am I, what am I doing um, is, is can be kind of hard to nail down. So take some notes, do some research online, uh, check out our, our website, or websites like Lilo, um, we also always want a good deal, right? Um, so check on prices and things like that. Think about what you want your toys to look like. What you what what are you exactly imagining when you see yourself playing? Um, aesthetics are super important in uh, just visually how you connect with a toy. Um, Sometimes if you don't like how a toy looks, you're not going to be excited to use it. This is my go-to, the Magic Wand. Um, it's just the OG classic. I really, really like it. Um, specifically this rechargeable one because like there's never not a time I can use this. I can't use this. Um, but I really like a more aesthetic look like this one. I'm super into like rose gold pink at the moment. And me just seeing this sometimes is enough motivation to want to pick it up and, and use it <laughs> um, and so connecting to it in that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's that with wands. Um, ask for body safe toys. Ask for things that are free of phthalates. Silicone as uh, what the heads of these are made of, which is also why I really appreciate it, is non-porous, it's body safe. It's gonna be easier to clean and take care of over time. Just because this toy isn't silicone doesn't mean you can't use it. A lot of strokers or um, stroking toys for penises tend to be made out of like a cyber skin or an elastomer, which is more porous, um, but there's just, you, you have to clean your toys and take care of it which is another thing to consider before you purchase a toy or start narrowing down your options. Um, make sure it's something you can take care of, make sure you can clean it and understand how it functions. So over time, you have that toy. Um, <clears throat> stainless steel, um, another one, the Pure Wand by Enjoy is one of my favorites because uh, it just, there's a lot of power in holding this. It's uh, sort of heavy and it can, it's not super big internally, but it can, it can uh, promote a, a feeling of fullness. Mm -hmm. And I just like that this is going to outlast me, basically, <laughs> you know, this is, this is a piece, it's artful, it's stainless steel, you're just going to have it forever. Have a budget in mind. Um, before you start looking, know where you want to be. It's, it's super stressful to think about money sometimes and um, having the idea that, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I need to have a lot of money to buy something that's even any good. We at the Pleasure Chest, we have a wide range of prices for all budgets. 
Um, so definitely uh, pin down how much you are looking to invest in these tools. Okay. And one quick moment. I have my plug fell. <laughs> I can show Ina a little bit. That's the first one on here. And then maybe we can move into to seeing if anybody has any questions. But yeah, Ina, I didn't show earlier. There's um, there's the classic Ina and then there's the Ina wave. And I'll just highlight this one real quick because it does have this like really lovely internal come hither motion that I personally really love as well as an external clit simulator. And I think actually somebody asked a really great question about um, internal and external orgasms. Um, but Ruth, I'm not sure, are we ready to go to questions or do we wanna spend a little bit more time on some of the gift ideas? No, we can go to questions and we can leave that up right there. For the okay, gift. perfect, okay. that sounds great. So the first question we had was from Margaret and Margaret says, I am trying a new lube, which is supposed to be okay for manual application as well as internally but it also happens to contain parabens. I'm wondering how concerned I should be or if brief exposure might not pose much of a problem. And I know it varies from person to person. I that is a great up. question. Oh, was there, I'm sorry. Oh no, what I was, was gonna throw it, I was gonna throw it in the chat too so everyone can see it again. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I think Ruth is going to just throw it in the chat so that everybody can. Oh, there it is. Perfect. Okay. I can't see the chat either. So. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Did you get the question though? Yeah. About okay. parabens and lube. Yep. Um, I, for external application, I think, so the parabens tends to be something that you want to stay away from. Um, in an external application or topically, that might be fine. I, in, encourage folks to make these decisions for yourself. Um, I, I tend to like stay away from parabens specifically internally. Um, but yeah, Casey, I don't know if you had a-, a any Yeah, I, I also personally would stay away from parabens, especially internally. Um, but if there's some other uh, reason that you're really drawn to this one in particular, whether maybe there's a special feature um, like temperature or something like that, um, usually you can also find that feature in a paraben free lubricant. Yes. Um, but yes, if you're going to use this one, I'd recommend just using it externally. Yeah, there are so many options and, and every day there's a new option that's more and more body safe. So um, keep researching um, at, for any specific ingredients that you are interested in in this particular lube. Um, check uh, comments and, and reviews on, on other lubes that might be very similar. All right, we have our next question, typing it in the chat now. Can you speak on depression um, affecting your signs, of, your signs of arousal and communicating signs of arousal to your partner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can jump in on this one. Um, so both depression itself and depression medication can impact um, experiences of arousal and signs of arousal. Um, I think one thing that is really important to note is that, you know, we normally think about arousal as a penis getting hard or a vulva lubricating, um, but the main way to tell whether or not you're aroused is to ask your brain. Your brain is the only thing that knows for sure if you're aroused because it's very possible to be aroused and to not be getting wet or to be aroused and to not be getting hard. Um, and I think, um, it's also possible to be hard and wet and to not actually feel very aroused at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so the only person who knows is you and nobody can tell you if you're aroused or not, only you can. Um, and so I like that we're talking about signs of arousal because they can be indications, but they're not you know, fully yes or no's. Um, so uh, certain uh, antidepressants specifically, I think maybe you're speaking to SSRIs, um, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, it can sometimes make it more difficult to lubricate and sometimes make it take longer to reach orgasm or sometimes difficult to reach orgasm altogether. Um, one challenge people face is that psychiatrists often aren't talking about sexual side effects of these medications. They're not making a lot of space to talk about your sex life and whether or not that's important to you. So I really encourage you if you're talking to your uh, doctor about meds to say like, 
orgasm is something that's important to me or um, becoming aroused in this way is important to me. Is there um, either a medication we can add to my regime that can help mitigate some of the sexual side effects? Um, or is there a different med that does the same thing that mitigates some of those sexual side effects? Now, of course, don't stop your medication without talking to your doctor. Um, stay on your medication. Um, but there usually are a couple different options you can try and some have less sexual side effects than others. Um, but the biggest one that people talk about is um, having a, a, an experience of um, it taking longer to, uh, to orgasm or longer to ejaculate. Um, and yeah, someone's chatting this right now. Uh, Wellbutrin is often a med that um, psychiatrists will go to um, when somebody is especially concerned about sexual side effects. And then communicating signs of arousal to your partner. I think sometimes it is helpful to explicitly say like, hey, sometimes I don't get wet as fast as my brain gets aroused. That's not uh, my body telling you to stop. It's just telling us like we need loop, right? Like there's, we don't need to get wet in order to have sex. This is the beauty of having loop, right? Um, you don't need a hard penis to have sex. That's the beauty of having other kinds of toys and other ways, oops, knocking all my toys over, other ways of touching ourselves. Um, and so having a conversation um, where you say like, hey, I know when I'm aroused and I'll tell you, you don't necessarily have to look to my body to tell you. Um, it can, it can be an indication, but, um, but only, you know, it. And so your words are going to be a powerful way of communicating that even when your body ne isn't necessarily doing the thing that it used to do before taking the medication. All right. We have two last questions. I know it's a minute after six, so we'll be quick. The next one is Lisa Diamond does a lot of studies on human sexuality and spoke about the myth of types of orgasms on a Netflix show. According to Diamond, all orgasms are clitoral orgasms since a clit is both internal and external. What's your take on that? Tania, you want to take this one? That all orgasms are either internal or external. It says um, all orgasms are clitoral because the clit is both internal and external. Yeah, the clit is both internal and external. Um, the And again, the, the point of kind of body mapping and figuring out what stimulation feels like externally, like literally externally, as well as, um, you know, the legs that extend um, internally um, that make up the clitoris, it looks like a wishbone. Um, and that is some like kind of indirect stimulation uh, that you can do externally as well to stimulate that internal clitoris. Um, but again, it's all one. I don't know why we have to like all or nothing. I'm not one for absolutes like all the time. And I'm a dramatic person. Like <laughs> I was a musical theater major. So I'm like, um, but when I tend to come across, um, I guess, dialogue that seems to suggest that something is all of this and or all of that, for me, it helps to think about it as one. Mm -hmm. um, and that I can kind of get to know my body to see what it feels like um, at different points um, based on the stimulation I give it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. All right, last question. Are aluminum alloy and ABS plastics body safe as a toy composition? Um, so they are porous. Um, a, a ABS plastic, um, and for toys that are porous, you can, you do have the option of uh, putting a condom on it um, if, if you're super concerned with um, perhaps playing with someone else. Um, I, as a rule for myself, my toys that I use on other bodies are non-porous, um, and I can, you know, clean them easily and, and better take care of them but you can put a condom on um, ABS plastic toy, uh, like obviously a condom, if you're allergic to latex, stay away from that. Um, kind of knowing the, as you're adding layers to your toy experience, like with your lubes and your condoms, um, talking about material is super important. If you ever get a chance to stop into a pleasure chest, and I'm not sure Ruth, if we can um, make a, available a link for our toy care guides, um, because it's kind of hard to hold all this information too about different materials, um, but checking that out. Um, porous toys in and of themselves are not bad. Um, they're, again, they're tools. 
And a lot of times the plastic, uh, ABS plastic toys um, tend to be less expensive and a little more price friendly for some folks. Um, but definitely make sure you're taking care of it. You have a good cleaning regimen. You're able to clean it immediately after you use it and storing it properly as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. The last thing we have, I found the link at the last second, of course. Um, we have a giveaway. So thank you for all of you that stayed till the very end. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, of course I've my screen has so many links hold on <laughs> what was the question it's like mine with the tabs <laughs> my the emotional hold on uh on browser tabs <laughs> all right so um first person who answers wins uh the sona to cruise what is not the opposite of spontaneity And looks like Lauren is our winner. Congratulations. Yay. Lauren, please email me at ruth at pleasurechest.com with your address and info, and I will get that out to you. I'm going to add it here in the chat as well. And for everyone that stayed till the very end, you also get a 15% uh, off your purchase for the next 48 hours on Pleasure Chest. Use code LOVE. This will get emailed out to you tomorrow as well as a reminder. Thank you, Ruth, for uh, shouting that out because I have some more discounts and deals for y'all. Um, if you are local in Chicago, check us out on the back cover of the reader. We have an ad running this month. And with that ad, if you bring it in, you get 15% off your purchase. And this is going on right now until March 3rd. Um, that code is also available um, or that deal is available on our website as well, just because we want you all to be able to explore and get the deals, get the deals. So um, the code to use online is BEST OF, all caps BEST OF, um, as we were uh, nominated for uh, Best Sex Toy Shop in Chicago. And we'll find out those results in March, which we will have another ad and possibly another deal. So keep, keep on the lookout. Um, if you are local to the store in New York, uh, Chicago, or West Hollywood, stop by and say what's up. Um, otherwise, uh, check out our website all the time. We're having new things, new things to explore, resources, more workshops. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and happy Valentine's Day. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Take care, everyone. <laughs>